continuing on our tour of applications of coding methods and information theory. In this video, we're going to take a look at some applications and examples of error correction codes. So just to remind you of the terminology here, error correction coding is also referred to as channel coding. And in the previous video, we were looking at these different applications of compression codes and compression coding is also referred to as source coding. So you can start getting familiar with that terminology. All right, so what are what are some examples of error correction codes? Well, the first we, there's no other place to start than with Hamming Hamming codes. So in 1950 Richard Hamming introduced a, a really elegant family of error correction codes, which we now refer to as Hamming codes. Before Hamming, there existed some, some, you know, sort of primitive, some basic techniques for error correction, like parity checks and, and repetition codes. But uh, they, they were not really, they didn't really do a very good job. And Hamming came along and introduced the, his family of codes and they really jump-started the field of error correction coding. Sometimes people call it, write it ECC. These were sort of the first reasonably good error correction codes. Now, you know, not too long after that, so they were sort of the state of the art for a while, but, but not too long after that, people came up with better techniques, and now there exist way, way better techniques than Hamming codes, but they are still used for certain applications. So one application of Hamming codes that is in use today is in RAM. So if you have a computer of any sort, a desktop or a laptop or notebook computer, or even something like a, you know, like a, a, P, a PS3, PlayStation 3, or Xbox 360, or, or, or Wii gaming system, they all have RAM. And what is RAM? RAM is the, the main memory of your computer. In other words, it's sort of the, the dynamic memory. In fact, this is called, these are called DRAM for dynamic RAM. So this is um, in contrast to the static RAM, which is sort of the stored memory. This is, this is the, the main memory that is actively being used in your computer while you're, while you're using it, uh, not on the hard disk. And it's stored in these little chips, these DRAM chips. And now you may be wondering, now what in the world, you know, you were talking about uh, you know, error correction is reliable transmission of information. But where, what does this have to do with transmission of information? We're just reading and writing from these little chips. Well, it turns out that this is not an error-free process. Reading and writing from chips like this is not an error-free process because there are little magnetic fluctuations and and you know little electromagnetic uh, variations that can come along and and uh, mess up the the stored information on these chips, and so you can have errors. You know you you take your file, you write it to the chip, and then later you want to read it back and you get the wrong thing, and so you have to be able to correct for those little errors that 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 occur. And Hamming codes are one way that are used to, to, to do that for these DRAM chips. Another way, sort of actually somewhat related, is for static memory. And w one way that people, if you really care about you know, the integrity of your data, then, then you might use a RAID system. And one of the lower level, I don't know if, I'm not an expert in this, I don't know if people actually use RAID 2. RAID 2 is sort of the low level, sort of more primitive type of RAID. There are better more sophisticated RAID type of schemes. But RAID 2 uses Hamming codes. And here you have, what, what you do is you have seven hard disks. There's seven disks here rather than just like one. And the data that you have is stored on these disks in, in a way that has some redundancy so that if you were to lose any one, if any one of the disks just died, just completely went kaput, then you could still recover your data, uh, all of your data without any errors. So that's the a feature of the what's called a 7-4 Hamming code, is that you can lose any one of the bits out of seven out of seven bits, you can lose any one bit and still recover your data without any errors. 
So these are some applications of hammock codes that are still in use today. But it turned out not too long after Hamming came along, people got well, were very encouraged by that, and they began to develop a whole series of different error correction codes. And uh, one family of such codes is called BCH codes. And perhaps the most widely used, sort of the gold standard in error correction coding for many years was, get rid of that little piece there, Reed-Solomon codes. Reed Solomon, introduced by Reed and Solomon. And these were introduced in 1960, so only 10 years after Hamming's original, original introduction of the Hamming codes. Reed and Solomon came along, and they developed a really, really sort of fancy mathematical techniques using abstract algebra to, to do error correction codes. And Reed-Solomon codes are often combined with convolutional codes. And so, so what, what's called RSV, for the V stands for Viterbi algorithm. It's the, the, the convolutional part involves a Viterbi algorithm. These RSV codes were the gold standard for many, many years. And, uh, and so they, had, they have a huge number of applications that have developed over the years. And here are just a few of them. So barcodes, maybe I'll, so you can still see Reed Solomon. Barcodes, I mean, just, I don't know if it's every uh, version, but a huge number of versions of barcodes use Reed Solomon error correction coding techniques so that if part of the barcode, you know, like if, if part of it got like ripped off or something like that, or it just became unreadable for some reason, you could still read the code. So, you know, if uh, you know, you're checking out at the supermarket, then they could still actually read what was supposed to be on the barcode. Reed Solomon uh, uses, uh, so uh, barcodes use Reed Solomon. Also, any CD, DVD, or Blu-ray disc uses Reed Solomon codes also. So every time you use a CD, you know, DVD, uh, Blu-ray, you're using Reed Solomon codes. Uh, and they're, they're particular, so one aspect of Reed Solomon that's very nice is that they're very robust to what are called burst errors. So if you have a burst of a sequence of errors that all occur very, you know, one right after the other, then they can be handled very well by these sort of Reed Solomon codes. And this kind of error can come up in, for example, in a CD, if you have a scratch that goes along the direction of the, the, the way that the information is stored. So these can correct up to 4,000 bits uh, that were lost due to a scratch. So that's pretty cool. Another application is in DSL. DSL lines, if you get your internet over the telephone lines, the DSL uses Reed Solomon codes. And also for many, for several years, if you had digital video, uh, you know, in terms of your TV, if you had digital, digital TV, it was probably using Reed Solomon codes because that was part of the, the DVB standards for, for digital TV. More recently, there have been uh, actually the, the, the newer versions of digital video broadcasting standards are starting to use some more modern codes that have been, that have been developed, and I'll, I'll mention in a, a little bit below. And one other computer application of Reed Solomon is in RAID 6. So this is, so this is, so we saw that, uh, you know, Hamming was used in RAID 2, and and Reed Solomon is used in RAID 6. So this is an example of, you know, you've got a bunch of hard disks here and your information is being stored in a way that is there some redundancy so you can recover your data if bad things happen to some of, some of these disks. And some really cool applications of Reed Solomon codes are to space exploration. So all of these space exploration missions used Reed Solomon codes. So the first one here is Voyager. This is Voyager, the Voyager one and two probes that went to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. 
used Reed Solomon codes to encode and transmit to to come to uh, to to transmit their data like like images so that you could recover any errors that that were introduced during the transmission across those you know huge number of miles the vastness of space uh, in which uh, the, those transmissions were sent and one you know very famous image here this is the pale blue dot image which uh, was so named pr probably I think by Carl Sagan and this is a very famous picture because if you can make it out there's this very tiny little dot here and that dot is earth that is earth as seen from beyond neptune so once uh once the voyager i think it was voyager one took this picture from when it was beyond neptune and that is earth right there so the fact that that we i mean that that's and that represented less than one pixel in this image so if if we if it were not for the 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 capacity of these error correcting codes there is no way that we would have been able to get a picture of the required resolution and low enough error that you could actually make out earth in this picture because it's only one pixel if you had errors then there would you would never be able to see where earth was or make it out at least so that is pretty cool and that would not be possible without these error correcting codes. And perhaps even more amazing, the Voyager probes are still alive and they're still sending back images. So I think it was just a year ago, they sent, uh, one of them sent back a picture of the solar system. And now uh, Voyager 1 is the farthest out and it's 17 billion kilometers from Earth. That's around 11 billion miles from Earth. And still using these amazing error correcting codes, they're able to send back pictures over those billions of miles and we can still get those pictures back here. So that's Voyager. And then here, this one is Galileo. Galileo. Galileo was a mission to Jupiter, an orbiter, and Galileo also used Reed Solomon codes. And then uh, what else do we have? Uh, let's see. Oh, right. So this one here, this is the Cassini Huygens. Cassini Huygens probe. And this was a, a mission to Saturn, also used Reed Solomon codes. And maybe just to give you give you a sense of the timelines here. So N Voyager was in 19, it was launched in 1977. Galileo was launched in 1989. Cassini was launched in 1997. And then also, so now we have the Mars missions. So this was this was the Sojourner rover from the Mars Pathfinder program. So this is Pathfinder. And this was launched in 1996. And this also used Reed Solomon codes. This is actually a picture of the rover on Mars. Pretty cool. So this picture was probably sent, probably encoded using Reed Solomon codes. I should mention that that these two here are artist conceptions. These are these two Galileo and Cassini, Cassini these are not actual pictures of the probes. These are artist conceptions. And this is, I'm not sure if this is, this might be a real picture on Earth or something. This is, but this is a real picture on Mars. And then more recently, the Mars Exploration Rovers, the MER, these were launched in 2003. And we had those, the two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. And this is also an artist conception of, of one of them. Spirit is dead, but Opportunity is still alive and operating, sending back images. And here is actually a picture. This is a real picture from Mars of uh, the, the sort of panorama of Mars. And I mean, that's a pretty darn high resolution picture. That's a pretty nice picture. So this was probably encoded using Reed Solomon codes. So Reed Solomon codes had a huge number of applications over the years, but uh, they, they there was still some improvement to be made. So the channel coding theorem, which which tells us the best error correction 
So what are the, the best that we can do for error correction that was proved by Shannon in 1948. These are, there's still a, a ways to go to get close to the Shannon limit. And so it turned out that in 1993, a group of French, uh, French communications experts, communications engineers, shocked the world when they introduced turbo codes. Turbo codes, so turbo codes in 1993, introduced by, and I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce some of these names, by Baru Glavio and Titimachima were introduced, and turbo codes were astonishingly good. They be, they came very, they were able to get much, much closer to the Shannon limit of how well you could do with an error correction code than anyone had been able to do so far. And so turbo codes are now, uh, uh, and some of their, so, some close on the heels of turbo codes uh, were Gallagher codes, low density parity, parity check codes really came into their own and were shown to be competitive with turbo codes. But these are now, turbo codes and, and uh, Gallagher codes are now the state of the art in uh, error correction codes. And so these have a huge number of applications. So turbo codes have been uh, are throughout the 3G and 4G standards. So if you have a you know like an iPhone or an iPad or or an Android, and you and or or just you know a computer, and you use 3G or 4G for wireless internet access, you are using turbo codes. And turbo codes are what enable you to get your data at such a high rate that is that was the improvement that was the the perhaps well, there might have been a couple other things but that was perhaps the most important contribution to being able to get your data at a higher rate so 3g 4g couple applications let's see what else things like lte if you've heard of these things lte Media flow, media flow. I think that's actually discontinued. WiMAX. These all use turbo codes. And more recently, so now that these sort of these sort of new and improved error correction codes have come have come out, NASA is switching over to using them. So the most recent Mars mission, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was launched in 2005, this uses turbo codes. And this is really cool because th they are able to send back very high resolution images. So one of the instruments on there is called the high rise. They have a whole bunch of other Im instruments also, but they're able to send back very, very high resolution uh, images with very, very low error rates. And so this image here, this is so cool. Just to give you a sense of how high resolution these, these images can be. These are the tracks of one of the rovers, one of the, the previous rover missions. These are the tracks left by the rover. And this, this uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was able to get a picture of the tracks. I mean, these, these rovers are not very big. So I think it's down to like, you know, 0.3 meter resolution. And uh, another cool, uh, actually just very recently, like a month or so ago, NASA announced, as you know, when I'm filming this video, NASA announced that they were able to get these pictures, the sequences of pictures that seem to indicate the presence of flowing water on Mars, which is a huge deal because, um, you know, they've detected, well, actually using, you know, this uh, perhaps primarily this Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, they've detected that there's a huge quantity of water ice on Mars, but they have yet to know for sure if there's actually liquid water, which is which is hugely important for knowing whether life exists or existed on Mars. And so uh, I wanted to show you just a cool uh, uh, little time series video. Okay, so let's see, where is this thing? Okay, so okay, so here we go. So this is a sequence of, of these very high resolution images and they were transmitted using turbo codes uh, from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And you see these little these little things. So it starts out here and now it looks like this is sort of growing. This sort of looks like this. They think that this is flows of, of, of water 
of liquid water but it's very cold liquid water it's like very salty uh, liquid water that's why it flows very slowly okay anyway I thought that was super cool and so I mentioned that that uh, following closely on the heels of turbo codes there was yet another another class of error correction codes that was discovered that also have very good performance so that was turbo codes and now our last stop on the tour is Gallagher codes let me switch colors that's kind of weird Gallagher codes which are also called low density parity check parity check codes and these codes were originally discovered by Robert Gallagher published in his his PhD thesis in 1960 at MIT MIT but and even though Gallagher was he went on to become a very famous communications uh, you know a mathematician working in in this area in communications and, and information theory his his codes were forgotten they were they seemed to be too inefficient for the computers of the time and so they they were seen to be to, to just be impractical and so people forgot about them for a number of years for nearly 40 years and then not long after turbo co codes came out it was around 1995 or 96 somewhere around there uh, david mckay and radford neal rediscovered gallagher's codes and found that they performed extremely well as well as turbo codes and in some cases even better uh, than than turbo codes and so low density parity check codes and turbo codes are are sort of at the forefront the state of the art of these these error correcting codes and it's really remarkable because they they can come very very close to the optimal limit of what you can possibly do with an error correcting code and furthermore they can do it very computationally efficiently which is just amazing it's just it's so cool it's so cool okay so anyway so what are some applications of these Gallagher codes well the the first picture here is is of a server farm this is a Facebook server farm I found a picture of, of, of uh, one of the server farms used by Facebook and this is every single blue dot in this picture is a server it's a computer and this is one row out of I think four or so that are at this server farm and these these Gallagher codes are used in this sort of application for very high-speed Ethernet so 10 gigabit per second Ethernet and they have even higher ones now uses Gallagher codes and you know you again you know you you, you may be wondering you know if I'm just transmitting over this this silly little this little cable from from point from one part of a room to another part of a room why would I need an error correcting code well that silly little Ethernet cable is just a copper wire and things can get messed up as the little electrons flow along the copper wire and so errors can be introduced in your your internet your Ethernet packets and you need to correct for those errors and if you're going to have very very high speed internet you need to have you need to be communicating at a very high rate and so you need to be able to to uh, have a good error correction code with very high rate so this is one application of these low density parity check codes another one is Wi-Fi some of the newer some of the newer Wi-Fi standards like 802.11n uses these low density parity check codes and another a really cool sort of internet application is uh, actually internet over power lines so here this is just you know your standard sort of wall electrical outlet and it is actually possible now for you to get internet through your wall outlet you so you could you can just plug in some device that is appropriately equipped and get internet over your wall outlet you know assuming that you're your whatever uh, I don't know what you call it, your power slash um, internet provider has that that capacity and uh, one one of the standards for for doing this is called 
I T U G H H H N. And uh, this is particularly uh, applicable, say, for like consumer electronics. You know, you have like a smart oven or something, smart dishwasher, but also for a smart grid. You know, if you want to have a, a very energy efficient power grid, then being able to control things, you know, by um, by internet, so to speak, is would be very useful. Okay, so that's a that's a really neat application, and this uses these Gallagher codes. Yet another application, modern application. Well, they're all modern. Is DVB-S2. So before we were talking about DVB, how DVB used the Reed Solomon codes, and some of the later versions. Well, in particular, the S2 standard DB, DVB standard uses these Gallagher codes. And this was this one S stands for satellite. So if you had, you know, you may have had um, digital television reception via satellite before and that would probably have used a DVB standard but now if you have HD TV over satellite your you know chances are you're using this DVB S2 standard and the one one of the key technologies one of I think maybe two key technologies that enables you to get HD TV over satellite is these Gallagher codes so it would not have been possible to get HDTV over satellite without this significant improvement in, in uh, error correction coding. And one last, our, our very last application here is, uh, is in some standards that are being used in China. So CMMB, which stands for China Multimedia Mobile Broadcasting is used for handheld it's basically you know transmission of a video uh, a video type of content from satellites to handheld devices and they use Gallagher codes or LDPC codes and another one so that's for handheld and then and then they also have one called DTMB which is for you know like regular televisions and, and stuff like that and they also used Gallagher codes and they, they use, so that would be for like HD TV and stuff like that. Okay, so we at long last have come to the end of our, our tour of all these applications. And I hope that you, you found that, that that useful to sort of get a feel for the just the incredible array of applications of these technologies. And uh, Hopefully these will th these examples will take these things which may have otherwise been sort of just abstract abstract concepts and and really illustrate you know in, in your mind for you to, to think about hey you know whenever I'm using my my uh, iPhone I'm using these these uh, one you know these technologies and so so you know uh, hopefully you'll you have gained an appreciation now for how ubiquitous these things are. And uh, these, these examples will, will give you a way to sort of concretely think about what these are being used for. All right, so that, was, that, was, that completes our tour. So we talked about in the error correcting codes, we had the, the Hamming codes, we had the Reed Solomon codes, Turbo codes, and Gallagher codes. And to me, it's just, it's really stunning how ubiquitous these are. I just, I mean, they're just integrated into the, the tools that we use every day. And they're really, really an essential part of these tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so I found this really fascinating to see all these, these applications, and I hope that, I hope that you did too.